production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Welcome to the City Club of Cleveland, where we are devoted to conversations of consequence that help democracy, so cherished and so endangered now, thrive. It's Friday, June 24th, and I'm Joy Roller. I'm pr a proud member of the City Club, and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Hank Klibanoff. He's an old friend of mine, a Pulitzer Prize and Peabody Award-winning journalist, a professor of Emory University, and recently appointed by President Biden to the U.S. Civil Rights Cold Cases Review Board, work he's going to speak with us about today. There's an oft-quoted line about history from a William Faulkner novel. The past, he wrote, is never dead, it's not even past. When it comes to so-called cold cases, this is very much the case. Klibanoff comes to his work on the Civil Rights Cold Cases Review Board after years directing the Georgia Civil Rights Cold Cases Project at Emory and hosting the Buried Truths podcast. Produced at WABE, a podcast, the podcast provides a platform to delve into unresolved and unpunished racially motivated killings. This is work Hank has been doing for decades. In 2007, he and co-author Gene Roberts won a Pulitzer Prize in history for The Race Beat, the press, the civil rights struggle, and the awakening of a nation. I met Hank in 1979, shortly after he arrived there to work as a reporter at the Boston Globe. Neither of us remember how or where we met, but I do recall that he introduced me to the concept of the beach house, which was great fun, and that he stood out as an intensely bright, committed, and, passion and passionate about truth and justice among my group of political reporters, campaign workers, and law students. In addition to his work at Emory, Hank has devoted himself to that passion by working in journalism as a reporter and editor for more than 35 years in Mississippi for the Philadelphia Inquirer and the, Atlantic, and, excuse me, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. We lost touch, as friends do over the decades, but one day I was searching for a podcast, and I came across the intriguing title, Buried Truths. As soon as I heard the mellifluous southern drawl of my friend Hank, I was hooked. The stories are upsetting, but told with such humanity, you can't stop listening. I told my sister Jan about the podcast. As soon as she heard it, being a former president of the City Club, she plotted to get Hank here to Cleveland to share his truth. I couldn't be prouder of my old friend and delighted to introduce him to you today. If you have questions for our speaker, you can text them to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet them at sit the City Club. City Club staff will work, to, will work to get them into the second half of the program. Members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Hank Klibanoff. Hi, y'all. <laughs> Mellifluous. <laughs> uh, it's so good to be with you. Uh, I am Hank Klibanoff, and I don't remember how Joy and I met, uh, and, uh, and I said, here, I study all these cold cases. I dig back in history and, and learn all the truths, and yet I can't even dig into the truth of my own life to remember <laughs> where we met, you know. Um, I'm glad to be back in Cleveland. I have uh, two important, to me, links to Cleveland. Uh, I... Uh, my uncle was uh, the rabbi at Fairmount Temple uh, and um, Rabbi Arthur Lelyveld, who was a rabbi for many years. And I came here once for his son's, uh, Michael's bar mitzvah, 
and it was the first time I saw a frozen body of water any larger than an ice cube. <laughs> okay, and it was Lake Michigan, I, Mi Erie, and I thought, it looks like an, you know I've landed on another planet. Um, I was in awe. The other one, and I was gonna do a contest, but we don't have time for that, okay? The other link is that I was in a very important location on a very important date in Cleveland history. But it has nothing to do, it didn't happen in Cleveland, okay? It happened April 17th, 1960 in Memphis. Very quickly, can anyone remember what it was? Hmm? All right, it was the day the Indians traded Rocky Calavito, okay? And I happened to be in Memphis with my father and uncle and cousin because it's worth remembering, this is for the younger people and I teach younger people and they're astonished to learn this, there were no pro sports in the South in my childhood. Not a single pro team. No New Orleans, no Atlanta, no Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay was nothing growing up, you know. Nowhere. Memphis, come on, you're kidding. Uh, they all came in around 1966, 67 were the first ones. And um, I went to Memphis because there was an exhibition game between two pro teams, the Chicago White Sox and the Cleveland Indians, and that was the day when Rocky Calavito, to his memory, as he was standing on first base, is made aware by the first base coach that he's just been traded, okay? I hope he used that great Southern expression we use when you learn something that you just can't believe. The hell you say, you know? Okay. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about cold cases, and I'm gonna talk fast, okay? Because we have a little time, and. I got a lot to say, okay? Um, I've been a learner more than a teacher on all this stuff. I am just amazed what I didn't know in my many years on this planet as a Southerner, uh, as a journalist in the South um, and elsewhere, uh, but uh, as I had the, the privilege and the opportunity to, to work on the race beat here, which I knocked this thing out and. 12 years, I think, so, um, and my co-author had it for three years before that, uh, and then again, as, a, as an instructor at Emory University, where I pitched to them this idea that I wanted to teach history through stories of unpunished, racially motivated killings, and guess what? They fell for it. I mean, they went for it, okay, and that's what I've been teaching for 11 years now, okay, and it's what I've discovered is beyond belief, okay? Not to mention what my students have taught me is where I'm, where I'm going with this. Um, and then again, when I got to do the podcast, started doing the podcast, uh, learning even more, taking the research even, even deeper. Uh, I start with the premise that it's never too late to learn. It's never, uh, and never will be too late to examine these stories, okay? If, even if all the perpetrators are dead, maybe even especially if the perpetrators are dead, and even if there's no hope for criminal justice. I teach because, and, be, and in our cases, all the perpetrators are dead. They can't be prosecuted, okay? I teach it because there's another judgment that's really important, and that's the judgment of history, okay? And history can adjudicate these cases, and history can render a verdict on these cases. The records are there and you can find out what happened and you can find out who did it. Now I am clear with my students, we're not just here to learn who done it. Because in many cases it's clear, we learn that in, in the first three weeks, okay? It's the why, it's the why, it's the patterns, okay? And we have a sort of a motto, a mantra that we use particularly on the, the podcast, when we understand who we were, we can better understand who we are. We started doing our first class in 2011, bef even before Trayvon Martin, okay? And as time has gone on, I have just come to see, I'm studying historic cases that are replicating, that are replicated today, again and again and again. And I don't have to tell you what those cases are, you know. So I'm just, uh, I just keep going through all these cases with the students and they're just making some amazing discoveries. I wanna give you quickly some of the lessons I've learned, okay? And I'm 
through my students. I want to talk to you about April about uh, A.C. Hall, 1962 in Macon, Georgia, 17 years old, goes to a club, teen club, uh, 62, for those of you who are of a certain age, was the summer of the first big Otis Redding song. And you'll get to hear it if you listen to the podcast, okay? These arms of mine. Okay, um, that's it. Don't walk out. Okay. Uh, and A.C. Hall is out walking with his girlfriend. Little does he know that a white woman has seen what she refers to as a colored man. It was the vernacular at the time. Y'all, I hope you'll allow that. Walking at, getting out of her husband's car, and then they go in the car, they look at the car, and they see a gun is missing. They call the police. They go looking with the police. The police say, yeah, get in the car to go look for a man with a gun that you don't know, but they do. And they come across A.C. Hall and his girlfriend, Eloise, and the headlights go up on them, and the white woman says, that's him there. And A.C. Hall starts to run and the police start to shoot their guns, okay? And um, the, the narrative from the police later was, oh, well, as he was running, and if anybody knows the Laquan McDonald story, it's like, as he was running, it looked like he reached into his pocket, it looked like he had a gun, it looked like he turned and was gonna shoot us, okay? Well, the research shows A.C. Hall could never have been there at that, stealing the gun, he was not there. He didn't have a gun, though a gun was found the next day, I can tell you where it came from. Uh, I mean, it was like a rare German gun, uh, you know, that had, I'm guessing was, came out of the evidence locker, but I can't swear that. But the, the, the patterns here are the slam dunk reliability of the self-defense argument that white police officers or white people would make. They'd say, yes, he pulled a gun, he pulled a knife, and again and again and again. That worked. It worked because jur all jur juries were all white. Lawyers were all white. Uh, they could appeal to the white jurors by, you know, your ancestors would roll over in their grave if you were to, you know, rule against uh, these white police officers. Um, there was also, and there still is, but there was also this uh, pervasive belief among white people in the criminality of black people. And when you combine that with the claim that he had a gun, white people, in my time, and I was born in, at the very last minute of 1949, not literally, but, and so lived through the fish. I can tell you, all this was true. It was all there, that people felt this way. Um, it was so pervasive that here's the privilege that the state of Georgia gave police to make sure that everybody knew that they were right. No matter what, they were right. And that is, if you were a police officer and you're accused of something, you got to go and sit in front of the coroner's inquest and listen to all the testimony against you. You got to go into the grand jury that's looking into you as the target and you got to hear all the testimony against you and then guess what? You got to give the last word. You got to stand up and give a speech the last thing the coroner's jurors are gonna hear, the last thing the grand jurors are gonna hear, and you got to do it without being sworn in and without being cross-examined, okay? So you want pr privilege? That's privilege, okay? And that's what happened in this case of the two white police officers who killed A.C. Hall, okay? And, um, the flaw was that in the midst of the coroner's inquest, and in a minute we're gonna go to an audio clip here in just one second from this, uh, not from the inquest, but an interview that I had later. Fr during the inquest, the flaw was that the medical examiner came in and his report showed that A.C. Hall had been shot dead on in the back, that there was no way he could have been turning, this, that, and the other, okay? Well, it, I, you know, the two officers are dead, and I tried to reach the family of the two officers, and I finally got a hold of the, the son of one of the police officers, and it was an interesting co conversation we had because, as you'll hear, he's being asked to reassess something he's believed to be true since 1962, that he'd heard from his father, okay? and. So why don't we go ahead and play this clip and um, then we'll come back and talk a little bit more. 
My dad was a fine, upstanding man, a good, honest Production man. and distribution and of City Club of forums and ideas to support, you know, his family. And I know what kind of man he was, and I just don't believe that. I just don't believe he done anything wrong. I talked with him later in life after I grew up, and I think what he done, he done in the line of duty. I don't think he done anything underhanded. He was protecting his life is what he was doing. As that last statement suggests, the story that Kenny Durden got from his father is roughly the same story you've been hearing from the police and the hoppers, with a few important differences. In Kenny Durden's version, A.C. Hall had a gun, and the shooting took place while officers Durden and Brown were chasing A.C. on foot. The lady that the gun was stolen from, she identified the guy, and when he ran, they got in a foot pursuit with him, and that's when my dad said that he pulled the gun out, and that's when he was shot. Right. Uh, I really believe what he told me to be the truth, and nobody will ever make me believe otherwise, and I don't think I'm being biased just because he was my dad. Right. I just know him. But now, there was something I needed to tell Kenny Durden, something he didn't know, and it concerned that report from the medical examiner. It was when the medical examiner came in with his report, and it showed that the young man had been shot right in the back. Uh. Then Kenny Durden repeated the version that he'd long believed to be true the version in which A.C. Hall precipitated the shooting. But Durden seemed to be searching for something that could explain how A.C. came to be shot in the back. Well, my dad said that he was running and that he reached in his back pocket like he was reaching for a gun or like he was turning to shoot or something. And that's when they fired, so I don't know. Let's not gloss over that last remark, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to make too much of this. After all, this is probably the first time Kenny Durden's ever heard a version that countered his dad's account. But he's clearly thinking about this alternative version. And then he says something that makes me wonder if he's wrestling, even struggling with this new information. If the young man lost his life, any other way than that, I'm terribly sorry. I mean, I'm sorry the young man died anyway. Uh, to me, that was an important moment for us um, because we're all having to come face to face with these hard, hard truths. Um, the one thing that I also say during this podcast, uh, and by the way, we were able to, after five years, to get the woman who was in the car and uh, kept her on the phone for nine minutes. Whew, man, I felt that was an accomplishment. But she said she didn't want to talk about it. Um, and, but it, I still kept her on the phone nine minutes, even though she said she didn't want to talk about it. Um, one thing that we come upon is, uh, you, you heard in the introduction, this is about racially motivated killings. I looked at the lives of uh, what I could of the two officers who killed A.C. Hall, and I, I cannot tell you that they were racially motivated, okay? Candor makes me tell you, I cannot tell you if they were racially motivated, but I know and I can tell you and I'm comfortable telling you they were racially conditioned to shoot and kill A.C. Hall when they would not have killed me, okay? And, um, and I say that as having been raised in the South, uh, having gone into the bookstores my favorite bookstore, we got newspapers from all over the South, and my home was in Florence, Alabama, not the biggest city in the world, you know, but, and I'd go in there, and you'd see all of the pulp fiction of the, you know, the scantily clad woman, you know, kneeling coyishly in front, on the front of the cover of the book, and behind her is a large black man stalking her. And you thought, that, there was a purpose for that. That was to make me afraid of black people and anyone who, who saw that, you know. It's everywhere, it was in the jokes, it was in the music, it was in just the everyday banter, okay, that we, that we 
are conditioned to, to not trust black people and to not believe them and, and to not respect them and who they are. And um, so I'm completely comfortable saying these men were racially conditioned to shoot and kill A.C. Hall. And, and this comes up again and again. Um, and by the way, in many of these cases, unjustified death came to innocent people not only because of the behavior of white law enforcement or white thugs, but often because of the callous indifference of the white elite, the white leadership, political leadership, and quite frequently, white medical doctors, okay? I'm gonna tell you about Clarence Pickett, 1957 in Columbus, Georgia, had recently been released from the state mental hospital in Milledgeville, Hosp at Milledgeville Georgia. I do not know what his condition was. And he'd returned to Columbus, Georgia. He was known to walk around town, talk to himself. He sold ads for the local black newspaper. Uh, most police, when they'd see him, and he'd be kind of wandering and confused, they'd say, preacher, you, you lost your way again? Come on, get in the car, let me take you to your sister's where you live. Very nice. But there were always one or two that wouldn't, and one in particular didn't, and he jailed Clarence Pickett and then went into the cell and just kicked and stomped. It was brutal what he did. He's taken to the medical center. Even the police chief is worried at this point that he's got a bad case on his hand. And he sends a police officer into the medical center with Clarence Pickett while a doctor is seeing him and treating him. And the doctor seeing Clarence Pickett showed his acceptance of some terrible, some terrible myths about black people and their tolerance for pain. And as he's examining Mr. Pickett, who it turns out had a torn and split, some people say duodenum, some people say duodenum, okay, and toxic juices are flowing. As he's writhing in pain, the policeman in the examining room says, so doctor, what do you think? And the doctor says, I think he's just putting on. And gives him a new analgesic, um, I forget the name of it all of a sudden, but anyway, and an aspirin, and sends him home. The next day, he's still in pain. His sister puts him in, a, in an ambulance, sends him to the hospital, and he's dead on arrival, okay? Um, and we're having multiple cases. We have multiple cases of doctors who are in a position to extend or save the life of a victim of, a more, of violence and didn't do it, okay? Um, I wanna turn now, given the time, to Ahmaud Arbery, which some of you know is a more frequent case. It was the first time I took on a case for the podcast that was not in that uh, modern civil rights era from 1945 to 1968, 1970, because as soon as I saw the video and heard, started hearing the stories, and within an hour, I'm typing up a note to all my podcast people saying, this is just too much like 1950. We have to do this case. Here we go again. Okay, I think there was a, a gerund in there that is a curse word. Um, and so I, I, there are just a couple of things I want to point out about it because I, I love that. I love, the, I love this podcast. Um, and, and one is that there was this presumption by the white killers that Ahmaud Arbery jogging through their neighborhood in South Georgia along the, the Golden Isles, the shore, is the interloper, that he has no right to jog by their home on their streets, okay? This is ours, who is he, okay? And I talked to this guy who wrote a beautiful piece for the Bitter Southerner um, and uh, a, a news, paper uh, online, um, and uh, Jim Barger, and he just did a beautiful, he's a lawyer, but he had studied, gotten his master's at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at University of Mississippi, and he had studied the Geechee culture and the Gullah culture, and he was very familiar, and he said, and in his piece, he said, you know, Ahmaud Arbery had basically more right, and you'll hear him on the podcast, say, to be on that piece of land than those white guys. If you trace Ahmaud Arbery's history, 
because genealogy, it goes all the way back to the original enslaved people who came from West Africa and were settled on Sapelo Island. And indeed, I did the research, okay? I had students doing the research on the three killers, and there they go back to the Confederacy. It, yeah, I, I started to say, was that a crime? Actually, it was, because they were part of a secessionist movement, but anyway. But, you know, that would not be unusual to find a person, a white family that's been there since the 1800s to have served in the Confederate Army, but they also owned slaves. It, an interesting fact, not, you know, it's not itself, you know, convincing, I don't believe every, I don't think racism is genealogically passed on. But, and, th and then we looked into Ahmaud Arbery, and you can trace him back to the most significant I call it the in royalty of the enslaved in South Georgia in that, in the, along the, the, the islands there, a man named Balali Muhammad, a literate Muslim who was a brilliant agronomist and who worked, his slave owner was very uh, progressive about his farmland and the two of them together made lots of money, although I assume the slave owner made the money, okay? but. Uh, Balali Muhammad gets to be quite well known. And when he died, he left behind a manuscript, 13 pages, that's at the Hargret Rare Book Library at University of Georgia, okay? And in Arabic. Well, Ahmad Arbery is a descendant of Balali Muhammad. And so I was quite comfortable saying, yes, he had more rights to be on that land than, than anybody, okay? So we go into, into that in that verdict. Uh, the other thing that is helpful is that those verdicts, one of the lessons there, the verdicts that w found the white men guilty, um, is it helps us take a measure of our progress toward a more just nation. You know, one jury was 12 white people and one black. Guilty, 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 guilty. That was the state court and then in federal court, that was nine to three, white people, two blacks, one Hispanic, and they were guilty, guilty, guilty. Lastly, I want to talk briefly here about uh, Isaiah Nixon, uh, and uh, maybe somebody will ask me a question about the Biden thing uh, after you know the board, because I might run out of time. So can I plant a question? You, right here. <laughs> you, can you? Yes, uh, that's my wife, okay, all right. Um, just as the earth can turn up, you know, long hidden holdings, uh, so can on-site research. Um, it's never too late to discover things. Uh, out of a page there, missing page. But um, Isaiah Nixon, a 1948 farmer, father of six, the youngest two weeks old, decides to vote in the Democratic Par Party primary in Georgia only the second time in Georgia history, post reconstruction, that any black, that black people could vote in the Democratic Party primary. Uh, they could vote in the general election, but it didn't matter because just about everybody was a Democrat and whoever wins the Democratic Party nomination is gonna become governor, senator, whatever it would be. And they insisted that, that, that this effort to say they could vote in the general election was just a ruse and they were right. And so. Dover Carter, the head of the NAACP, is trying to get people to vote. He gets Isaiah Nixon to vote. And on election day, Dover Carter is shuttling people back and forth to the polls, him and his wife, Bessie. And then Isaiah Nixon votes, Dover Carter votes. And later in the day, they beat the hell out of Dover Carter. Two white guys, brothers, beat the living hell out of Dover Carter, leave him on the side of the road. He, his kids get him. And then he very quickly moves to Philadelphia with his 10 kids. And he left behind a lot. His wife's father was the largest black landowner in this particular county. Uh, Isaiah Nixon, late in the day, is at his farmhouse. And these two, uh, these two white guys, one of the same brothers and then another, and showed up and said, Nixon, come on out here. We want to talk to you. And they knew him. They grew up with him. As Isaiah Nixon's mother said, we, they had lunch in our house growing up. And now they're caught up in this racist fever of a madman candidate who had been governor three times and had run for a fourth, Eugene Talmadge, 
and his son, who lived in our lifetimes, Herman Talmadge, who was running for governor and was later a U.S. senator for many years from Georgia. And, and there's just this fevered pitch against black people that comes up again and again and again. And so these two white men show up at Isaiah Nixon's farmhouse and in front of all of his kids and his mother and neighbors, said, Nixon, come on out of the farmhouse. We want to talk to you. And he comes out. And he comes down the steps, and they've got guns out. And one says, got two questions. Did you vote? He says, I reckon I did. He says, who'd you vote for? Well, it wasn't Talmadge. And some, they said, come go with us. We want to go for a ride. And maybe he'd already known what had happened to Dover Carter. I don't know. But he said, I'm not, I'm not going with you. Three times they shot him. And he died a couple of days later. And, and by the way, just to give you what, what the reality was at the time, he dies in Montgomery County, but he had to go two counties away, not in his own car. He only had a buggy wagon and a horse named Della, a mule, okay? And the, but the, the so if neighbor comes and, ch and drives him later that night, they have to go two counties away to find a hospital that will take a black man. So he dies there in Dublin, Georgia. Um, so I've gotten to know very well the Nixon family. His daughter, Dorothy, is the star of the podcast. And when I, I'll tell you just quickly, when she walked out on stage at some public event we did in Atlanta, and people have only heard her. They've only listened to her on a podcast. And she walks out on stage, and I introduced her. 400 people at the Atlanta History Center stand up and give her a standing ovation. I, we were both crying so hard we couldn't, we couldn't get our interview going, okay? Um, and now I also was getting invited to the, to the Dover Carter family reunions. He told, as I told you, takes his family to, to Philadelphia, but he, you're about to hear, he always wanted to be buried back in Georgia, okay? Um, so I want you to uh, hear this final little clip. A few minutes later, we arrive at Live Oak Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, Georgia. It's a sweet country church with a small cemetery behind it. And as we walk to the graveside of his parents, Dover and Bessie Carter, a chorus of crickets and cicadas greet us. Now, Dover Carter may have fled Alston in fear, but Aaron says his dad always wanted to be buried back in Georgia. He always wanted to be here. He's where he wanted to be. Dover Carter lived to age 81, almost 40 years after that fateful election day. And his wife, Bessie, well, looking at her headstone, I was able to do some fast arithmetic, and I smiled. She was born in the year 1910, and she died in 2009. My goodness, she lived 99 years. But wait, this gets better. I need to tell you that in the time I've spent with the families of Isaiah Nixon and John Harris and Dover Carter, I've noticed many strong and similar threads. They believe deeply in God. Education is the ticket to a worthy and worthwhile life. And nothing should ever keep them from voting on election day. It's remarkable to learn that Bessie Carter lived long enough to cast her ballot for a black man for president, Barack Obama. Oh, I think it was one of the proudest minutes of her life. I can imagine now that, you know, looking back when she wasn't allowed to even to vote, uh, but then, then now she's voting for a black man. It was the crowning part, I think, of her life. Barack Obama was inaugurated on January 20th, 2009. Bessie Carter would die five days later. So I think we'll take questions. <laughs>
Wow, that was incredibly powerful. I, I, I'm hearing some sniffling, and, and if anyone needs some tissues, let me know. <laughs> we're, we're about to begin the audience Q&A. I'm Cynthia Connolly, Director of Programming here at the City Club. We are joined by Hank Klibanoff, an American journalist and professor at Emory University. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those, of, those joining via our live stream at cityclub.org or radio broadcast at 89.7 IdeaStream Public Media. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club. You can also text them to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794, and our staff will try to work it into the program. May we have the first question, please? Our first question comes to us um, from a text. So with so much xenophobia at this time against immigrants, particularly those of color, and an increase in attacks against Asians, do you see parallels between the root causes of this violence in Georgia's cases you've covered and xenophobia today? What is different? Thank you. No, I see close parallels. Mm -hmm. I think we're at a period of um, uh, impatience, of not willing to uh, open our eyes, our ears, and our minds, not willing to learn other people, not willing to learn their stories, their cultures, um, and um, to get to know people beyond, um, you know, whatever comes across some phony story across Twitter or on TV news or whatever. And I also think that we're at a time, uh, you know, I, I also study the 1906 Atlanta race massacre, which a lot, the largest mass killing in Atlanta history, 26 people at least, and we know it was more than that, black people. And um, it all happened during a political campaign, happened in the midst of a governor's race, in which both candidates were doing a lot of, ser uh, a lot of serious race baiting, and all four newspapers just collapsed and just were spouting all the race baiting stuff and not holding anyone accountable for what they were saying. Uh, I think we've gone through a period of political hysteria now and, and mania, um, and um, I think I do see a lot of similarities. It was uh, amazing the thing, stories that you tell. My question for you is that as, as Americans who came from Europe, running away from uh, religious intolerance, and then come to the United States and then create tremendous amount of stress and uh, savagery against the Native American, and then we go to the next generation a few generations later is the Chinese Americans or the Chinese that came and then so the African American. I mean, and then we are unwilling to learn from our history. We are banning books in America that teaches history that is our history. And we have heroes that were defeated who were uh, 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 insurrections and uh, created, tried to separate United States. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with our society that we are unwilling to learn from our history? Mm -hmm. um, we have not valued history as we should have. We haven't valued it in the schools, uh, I don't think. Uh, I, I can't tell you I was all over history in high school or even in college. I mean, I took courses and was astonished once when I thought I was one sh cry, uh, credit shy of graduating and, you know, weeks the clock was ticking and... Uh, and a guy walks past me, and I was st standing outside a dorm, he says, hey, I just picked up the papers from Professor Chambers. Uh, you, you did great, you, you got an A. I said, what are you doing looking at my paper grade, you know? But the guy left him in a box, you know? He said, I said, oh, thank you, you know? He said, yeah, four credits. I said, no, three credits. He said, no, no, it was an honors course. And so I wasn't even paying close enough attention to know that I actually had enough credits to graduate, okay? <laughs> Um, we, I don't know how we get that back. I mean, I've always loved this idea of trying to merge the interest that Sandra Day O'Connor had in civic literacy, okay, with this newborn of the last five, six, eight years, uh, or more than that, interest in news literacy, you know, and merge these two so that people can become more knowledgeable about civics and how we do what we do and to, you know, and how elections are run uh, up against news 
literacy and how stories are put together, how truth is gotten and obtained, and, who you, and how you as the uh, scrutinizing reader can discern the truth from falsity. Um, that, doesn't, that's, that, I think, makes history more credible down the road. You shouldn't have, no one should have to rely on me to learn history, you know, but that is what we're doing. And I, I feel privileged that I had a chance to learn it all again, okay, about my own history in the South by the research that I did. When I say 12 years, they were 12 hard, long, learning years. So I, that's all I can, that, that's not the clue, that's not the button we can push, you know, to make it happen, but it's what I think we need. Uh, good afternoon. I am so glad you're here. Thank you. Uh, the white supremacists are running this country, all the way from the State Board of Education, of which I am a member, to our Ohio legislature, all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And, you know, it's, it's hard to hold on to hope, but I do that. And I think that we have to find our hope in our younger generation. 18-year-olds um, can vote uh, as long as they're 18 by election day. Could you talk about, um, and deadline for voter registration is July 5th, in case y'all didn't know. Um, can you talk about the importance of our younger generation trying to turn this whole thing around? Well, I think it's, to me, on the one hand, I want to say it's self-evident. On the other hand, I don't know that it's really going on. I'm thrilled to see tables of young people here. It, and if you are old enough to vote and you haven't registered, don't forget you have till July 5th. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, it's, it's history worth learning. You know, it's one of those things that's good to be smart about is the history and how we got here, okay? Um, I, it, it's not because you'll always be the smartest person in the room, but you might, the knowledge that you have might be put to better use than what, than other kinds of knowledge, okay? Because it's, it doesn't matter if you're a, a physician or a physicist, you know, uh, or um, uh, if anybody still works at Western Union, you know, or, or UPS driver, whatever it is, what we all hold in common is this democracy, this, this fragile democracy in this nation it's what we all have together, okay? And that there's no, there's no way we should ever risk losing it, okay? There are other things that I wanna say that are self-evident. Like when I, I am very much a, in favor of prosecuting people for crimes they, they, they committed, for murders they committed long ago, okay? If we find an 80, if I found an 89, 95, 110-year-old man who committed a crime? We're gonna make we're gonna make it news, and we're gonna make it known. We're, I will never. I, I'm a journalist. I don't take my findings to the DA or the Attorney General. We put it, we published it, and let the DA then decide to do it or not do it. That's just an old journalism ethical standard that you don't really become a, an arm of of law enforcement. But you want it out there, and why? Or why do we even do this? Well, when I started doing this work. That was, there were still living perpetrators, okay? And keep this in mind. We are in, we are in disagreement in this country about a lot of things from state to state to state. L laws in New Mexico are different than laws in Oregon, different from laws in Maine, different from laws in Illinois, okay? Except for one standard that persists in all 50 states. And that is there is no statute of limitations on murder. Okay, if you murdered somebody in 1942, 48, and 19, and 2002 and 2022, they can come after you anytime. And, and anyone who has committed a murder, the ones that I've looked into, those people should not go to bed at night without wondering if tomorrow is the last time they're gonna be free. Okay, and, that, and so that's, that's my why. Now, most of these cases aren't the, the perpetrators are dead, okay? I still say there's no statute of limitations on the judgment of history to bring these cases forward and, and people can know the truth of what happened. So I'm not sure if I, that wasn't fully responsive, but July 5th, everybody, don't forget. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Well, thank you first for all the work you do and, and for coming to, to spend the, uh, the afternoon with us. I'm wondering what the general reception has been to your work. These are, I'm, I'm assuming generally men, but officially their reputation is one of innocence uh, and this is uh, challenging that. We heard the man's son maybe giving some different thought, but I'm, I'm interested to know kind of the general reception uh, you've received to, to dig into the past yeah. in this way. Um, I, the, one re the one answer I can't give you, and I sort of, frankly, I regret it, but I'm one person. I do have my students, but there's limited time with other obligations. Um, I can't tell you what the reception was down in um, Montgomery County, where Isaiah Nixon lived, among the, the white people, <laughs> okay, who might have known the killers, okay? But except for this, that can, uh, Liz, can you just show that, the, remember the other photos that you had? I want to show uh, something that y'all don't mind. Uh, there's like four slides, and I'm going to, uh, the first one is just me walking across the street with students reenacting uh, A.C. Hall's final steps the night he was killed in October of 1962, and then we did it again later at night, at the same time of night as he did. Then the next one is going to be, it says Isaiah Nixon, that's, was his, head, his grave site, the slab over his body. I'm going to tell you about that. And then is there a way to, uh, that's the grave site. Is there a way to freeze it or no? Okay. So the family buried Isaiah Nixon and then fled. Although Isaiah Nixon's widow, who was still alive when we did the podcast, and you'll hear her on there, okay. She said, we didn't flee. We weren't afraid. I thought, <laughs> that's not it. But I heard, but I'm not going to argue with you. Miss Nixon. Right. So the family, at, right after they left to go to Jacksonville, Florida, when they finally felt it was safe to come back to Georgia and to go to Old Salem Cemetery where they'd buried him, they couldn't find his gravesite. Couldn't find it. And I mean, they went year after year after year for the cleaning of the cemetery. Couldn't find it. Okay? And I'll tell you why. On the front facing of the headstone, there's no words. It's not his name. And it's not that it was there and washed away. It never had his name. And on the back, it didn't have his name. Across the top of the headstone, it says father, but that could be a lot of people. And what they hadn't realized was that slab of cement that you see there had sunk, okay? And it was covered in weeds that were just like strangling weeds, you know? And a lot of leaves, and there's a gnarly old tree over it. Year after year, they came and looked, and it was covered, you know, just a whole layer of grass, uh, thick enough that when the mowers came through, they just went over it and didn't. And my student happens to be standing, that's Dorothy Nixon, who's the star of the show, happened to be standing there one day when we, the first time we went down there. And she's standing there, and as she's looking down at the headstone, and then she looks down on the ground, she sees that, like, I don't know, maybe a pounding rain or something had cleared away some of the weeds and the leaves, and she saw an I, and she saw an S, and she says, I found it. You know, and then she's on her hands and knees, clean, and she sees SEP. She knows he died September 10th, 1948. The students are fairly well knowledgeable about all this stuff at that point. She had found Isaiah Nixon's gravesite 67 years after the family lost sight of it. And then a couple of months later, Dorothy finally was able to get there. Her, she couldn't come right away for personal reasons, but she was able to get there. And the next one, if you would, and then you can stop it, is her reaching down and rubbing her name, her fingers over her, hus her father's name, okay? After that got written up in the Wall Street Journal, uh, we get a call from a man that, I'm giving you the short version. Um, uh, he emails somebody, actually it was my daughter, because she had done the Vimeo that I put on her website, you know, and he sends her an email and says, I'm the nephew of the man who killed that man, Nixon. Who can I talk to? And my daughter calls me and says, Dad, you've gotten me in too deep now. <laughs> but, um, and I assigned it to my students. I said, call this fellow and see what it was. And they came back. They, they said, he wants to apologize for his family. I said, where does he live? They, 
They said Jacksonville. I said, Jacksonville, Florida, the same place where Dorothy lives? This is impossible. You know, I don't trust him. You know, but he was very trustworthy, and indeed, he did apologize. And you'll hear that whole meeting of Dorothy Nixon with uh, Keith Johnson uh, when he does apologize on that podcast. Um, so one of the things is that we are getting some response, some of the, uh, whether it's an apology, or plus, if I might say this, I, uh, I never did a podcast. I had no idea what these things were, you know? I mean, um, it's, a, it's got more than three million people have listened to it, you know? So, and I haven't heard anyone complain yet. I'm not saying they all love it, but I'm saying, so I just, I'd like to think that that's having some effect, but, you know, I don't know. I thought the Ahmaud Arbery, everything we brought up came up at the trial months later, and I thought, wow. I'm glad we were a little right on that because you'd hate to be really wrong, you know, about something like that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I want to start by thanking you for speaking with us today and by leading by example um, and showing how those of us who are able to come from a place of privilege should use that to bolster those who cannot. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you were born in 1949. Um, Did I say that? <laughs> oh, got it on record. <laughs> Um, and I was born maybe a couple years after that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to take this opportunity to ask you, as somebody who was born in that time in the South, um, a lot of times when I am speaking with people who are of the same age as me up here in the North, um, we are, or some people are so willing to forgive those who came before, saying it was a different time, it was a different place. But we know that that can't be just a blanket true statement because like even at the signing of the declaration, there were abolitionists in the room. Um, so I'm wondering, as somebody from that time, from that place, um, how you would respond to somebody saying, well, you know, we have to forgive them. Everybody thought that way there and at that time. And how could we maybe use that knowledge that no, that's wrong to have an impact on today's legislation? Mm -hmm. That's a really great question because it really, makes you think about where your heart is not just where your head is but where your heart is on these things and I um, even when I said I think anyone who committed a crime back then who can be found who can be located should absolutely be prosecuted um, I want to and I sound pretty firm about that and I, but I want to distinguish myself I I'm not an, such an ideologue that I don't understand extenuating circumstances or that I don't have an emotional thing. You know, I, when I, I, I have an emotional response when, you know, uh, a very old, frail person is discovered and identified as having been a guard at a, ho at a camp during the Holocaust. Y'all had one here, right? You had a major one here, right? I remember that. And, and yeah, part of me wants to say, well, yeah, he's got to pay the price. And there's a mother who say, well, it's really easy for you to be so glib. And I'm not glib enough. It's glib enough. You know, so. so, yeah, I, it's good. It's important to, um, to have a heart on these things and to have s some flexibility. But I think that that's why I get away with saying I'm not prosecuting. I'm just telling the stories. You know, and I want, and the stories will reveal the names. There's no doubt. You know, if we got them. We're going to reveal them. That kind of thing. You know, and we'll let judgment. We'll let the readers take that moment. You know, uh, we're going to have this come up. I told you about. No one asked me about the Biden board. Okay, the, quickly, quickly, because I got to be quick. Okay, um, people who use the Freedom for, Federal Freedom of Information Act to get records about these civil rights cold cases have a lot of difficulty. Okay, and no one's out to get them or to stop them. It's just that there's masses of records. No one really at the FBI or National Archives feels that that's their number one responsibility. Is that, so it's taken a long time. So, con so um, I was pushing Congressman Lewis to try to come up with legislation. He, was, he and I were working on it. And then Doug Jones got elected to the U.S. Senate, and he had been part of some of my meetings, and he proposed legislation that would bypass the Freedom of Information Act and create an independent review board that would get all these records and make an independent judgment and you know, to, to release these with, an, with the 
the goal of releasing all these records. Get them out there so families can go online. They don't have to write a letter. They can go online, type in their name, and see it, okay? And that's um, that legislation passed. Let me give you a moment of kumbaya. I'm in the Senate chamber the day that Doug Jones gives a speech. I figure he doesn't have a chance in the world of getting this passed because I don't think Mitch McConnell's going to let Doug Jones get that passed in the, and back then. Then he's going to have when Doug's going to run for re-election, and uh, he's only Doug's only got one co-sponsor. It's Claire McCaskill, and she's already lost. Okay, so this is a fool's errand, I think. And that day, while Doug's giving this beautiful speech, introducing his bill, nice shout out to the work that several of us do. The presiding officer of the Senate is Ted Cruz. Hold your fire. <laughs> Ted Cruz listens to Doug, and after he's finished, he goes up to him and says, Doug, I had no idea about any of this. I mean, I know the civil rights, you know, the, the violence. I know the brutality. I know the, the fatalities. He says, but I never knew that we hold all these records, that families can't get them, there's this, that, and the other. And sign me up. And he became a co-sponsor. And it passed the Senate, voice vote, no dissenting votes, goes to the House and passes, I can't recall, five, six, seven, eight dissenting votes, and that's all. President Trump signs it, and then, but doesn't get around to naming the members. And then President Biden put it on his first 100 days list, and, we, and it's, there are five of us, only four right now. There will be a fifth, you know, and... Um, we have the onerous task, at least under the narrow classification of civil rights, of going through 83,000 cubic feet of uh, records. So that's what I'll be doing for the rest of my life. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, what a joy. Thank you so much, Hank Klibanoff, for joining us here today at the City Club. And thank you again to Joy and Jan Roller for your collaboration. Today's forum is part of our Authors in Conversation series in partnership with Cuyahoga Arts and Culture and the John P. Murphy Foundation. We would like to welcome guests at tables hosted by the Ace Summer Experience Program, Friends of Dave Nash, the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, Shaker Heights High School, and Summer on the Cuyahoga. If anyone is with us in attendance today would like to hear more about a campaign that we have underway at the City Club, please feel free to join us after the closing gong for a short reception in the Mandel Room across the lobby. A heads up, we are off Friday, July 1st in observance of Independence Day. You can catch us again on Friday, July 8th. We will be joined by Crystal Bryant, Executive Director of the Cleveland NAACP. A very relevant conversation after today. She will examine what black freedom means in America today. Tickets are still available, and you can learn more about this and other forums at cityclub.org. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Hank, and thank you, members and friends of the City Club. I'm Cynthia Connolly, and this forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.